Uh, before we jump into the event, I just wanted to review some of the technical best practices for the Remo platform that we're using today. So Remo tends to work best on a computer rather than a smartphone or tablet, and Google Chrome tends to be the best browser for connection as well. If you are having connection issues, first try refreshing the page, uh, but we've also found that sometimes a VPN may block access as well, so you may have to either disable that or try using a personal computer. I'm also happy to help anyone get connected if you are having trouble, so you can message me in the chat function of Remo, and we can get you connected. Uh, throughout the presentation and panel, we'd also like to welcome you to engage with us and ask questions within the Q&A tab on the right, and we'll make sure to cover those topics during the panel. So now that that's covered, let's get into the content you came for. Uh, Link3D's Mark Seaton and Kenny Pearson will be kicking it off with a 20-minute presentation on Link3D's perspective on digital transformation for AM in the energy sector, specifically oil and gas. But then we are honored to have two industry experts, Faisal Iqbal from Baker Hughes and Dan Brunimer from X1, join us for a panel to get a broader view into what should be considered when thinking about digital transformation within the energy industry. So I'd like to welcome Mark Seaton and Kenny Pearson. You should be on stage now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. You know, we miss physical live events a lot, uh, especially in this industry. And when you do a live event, you get walk-up music. So Kenny and I, uh, with the spirit of the gold records behind Kenny, we do a little music this morning. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us. You may have joined us this spring when we did our first digital conference to bring the industry together. Then we bit off a lot in a digital additive manufacturing marathon and after 26.2 hours of content, we're just about now recovered and thinking about doing it again next year. Um, but then we realized Link3D obviously isn't a events company, but the industry does need um, to come together and talk about the challenges we're facing. So Link3D is continuing to do regional events. We have our jam series in Japan. We're gonna start a series in Singapore. So we have those. But this one's a little different. We're diving into a specific topic that's a real, a real challenge in the industry, digital transformation, and breaking it down for a specific industry, in this case, oil and gas. And leading the charge for us today is our head of industry for energy, Kenny Pearson. I, I forgot to mention, we're, I'm gonna really try and not make this for Link 3D, because I think it's important to talk about our point of view on the challenge, but just so everybody knows, Link 3D is software. Software for additive manufacturing. We consider it the operating system for your factory floor. End-to-end -end analytics, we'll, get, we'll hit some of those topics, but mainly let's just talk about what's needed in the, in the industry. Um, on to you, Kenny, our head of industry. I'm gonna share some slides. Um, one quick housekeeping. Uh, Kenny and I are obviously up on screen. If you'd like to see the slides, you can hit the arrows to make them bigger. Um, and some of them are pretty complex. So um, if you'd like the slides afterwards, feel free to email Kenny for those slides. Beautiful, thank you, Mark. Um, and over the past few years, we've had the opportunity to work with and partner with quite a few oil and gas companies. And we've learned a lot. Um, over the past few years. And I'd like to share some common key findings with you today. Let me just pull up this presentation here. Perfect. So first, let's just break down the markets, right? So you have your upstream, your midstream, and your downstream. So the upstream, these are your exploration companies that are going to be drilling, you know, exploratory wells, maybe even some production wells. Um, and we've seen additive grow a lot, and specifically the 3D printing of drill bits, uh, we see a lot of printing of drones and even structural components in the upstream. Now, moving on to the midstream, these are your extraction and transportation companies that are going to be taking the hydrocarbons from the wells to the refineries. And we've seen a lot of growth here again in additive with the 3D printing of, we've seen valves all the way to pumps and other equipment as well. And if we take it to the downstream, these are the refineries that are going to be taking the hydrocarbons and making them into viable products. 
And similar to the midstream, uh, 3D printing is becoming very prevalent in the downstream with parts like uh, you have electronics, you have spare parts, and you have replacement parts, all to help minimize the downtime of turnarounds. And during all of this, each market is going to work with the following set of players across the supply chain. So first, let's take OEMs, for example. Uh, so I'm an OEM, I have design authority, I can either choose to manufacture and engineer parts myself, or I can outsource to service bureaus or tier one suppliers or contract manufacturers. And either for, you know, full production, maybe for overflow, or for disaster recovery purposes. And that takes us to quality standards. And, you know, quality standards have been around in the oil and gas industry for years. But when we start to think about additive manufacturing, there's a lot of new standards that are starting to be developed just to support the emerging technologies. Yeah, and Kenny, you, you know, you've broken down the market. When you think about digital transformation, who are we talking to today? I think it's everybody here. Yeah. It, yeah, it affects it, anywhere from a service bureau specializing or even just dabbling in the energy sector all the way to the OEM with design authority, digital transformation, covers that whole ecosystem. Agreed, and, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Kenny. And every one of the players hits the hits on these same challenges to different degrees. You know, it, it is incredibly difficult to get a part qualified and certifi certified and then collect the data and create the processes to maintain that certification. How, how do you maintain security when you are creating a part um, in a lab or a facility and then potentially printing it far away in a remote location, even on a rig. How do you make sure that whole transmission is secure and repeatable and traceable? And I think the biggest challenge, and we have so much respect for our partners in energy and oil and gas, because of there's no tolerance for risk for the environment or safety. You know, e even use cases like creating scaled prototypes of complex deployments ahead of time to prove out, make sure it's safe, or just learning how to make a part in a facility um, when the one expert who designed it is not there and having all those steps documented so it's done safely every time. Um, incredible challenges that we all face and, and that can be solved to some degree with digital transformation. And uh, some of the Folks on the webinar today may be thinking, you know, I'm just an R&D shop. I do a little bit of prototyping. Um, this doesn't apply to me. But as we break it down, and on this slide, along the top, these different additive use cases, from R&D all the way to jigs and fixtures, and then along the sides in white are the different considerations that can help you address those key challenges in additive. And Kenny, where do you want to start? Let's, let's dig into the details on these. Yeah, Mark, let's focus on the considerations for R&D and prototyping first and setting up a digital infrastructure to scale here. Um, so there's a lot here, but I'm going to focus on a few. So first, we'll talk about security. Uh, so first, we need to identify, you know, what level of requirements and security are these parts that we're printing? And are they going to require us to be on premise with a solution in a private cloud or maybe even a public cloud? And then to take it a step further, we can start to integrate with companies, SSOs or single sign-ons to start tracking individual aspects. Then when we get into the RFQ and orders, I mean, just like any organization, streamlining your requests in a centralized location is going to help you organize your data, save time, and really start that end-to-end -end digital trail, if you will. Um, some examples I've seen, you know, there's a lot of companies that have multiple ways to submit orders, right? So they might be sending in an email with an order. Maybe there's uh, a formula, or sorry, maybe there's a form on your website where you're submitting orders. Maybe you've got your own specific homegrown solution, but there's really no centralized location and people are starting to piece together um, all of these orders in that situation. Then we get down into planning and production. So whether you position yourself as an internal service bureau or a 3D printing operation, being able to have a system that can host you know, your routing uh, distributed manufacturing and capacity planning. And then the last thing we'll touch on for R&D and prototyping is logistics. So instead of having your shipping department, you know, double down on data, inputting information for packing slips, shipping invoices, 
you know, Link 3D and or a system like Link 3D can help you generate all of that data. And Kenny, how does this change when you switch to um, series production or, or jigs and fixers? What what different things are added? So there's a few differences, Mark, but a lot of it is still the same. But let's just focus on what's in blue here. It's a little bit different. Um, so security again for series production. We're going to talk about counterfeit parts and minimizing the risk of counterfeit parts. So for example, I'm an OEM. I've created the recipe for this part along with the CAD file as well. And I want to ensure that that file doesn't get in the hands of a third party so they can try to re-engineer this part. Um, another thing we've seen is the need for digital catalog catalogs and having qualified parts in a digital catalog. So as companies are starting to mature an additive, we want to make sure that you know, we're integrated with your corporate infrastructure. So when someone places a part through your digital catalog, it can auto populate into like a production queue. And then one last thing we'll touch on for series production all the way to tooling, jigs and fixtures is the quality. You know, with quality and with compliance comes maintaining compliance. And you'll, you'll want a system in place that can validate each step of your workflow and that it was met. And a digital certificate of conformance can help demonstrate that. And, and Kenny, I think the underlying theme here is, is what our own Roxanne Warren likes to say. Digital transformation enables operational excellence. And you need to think of each of these considerations and have a plan or processes in place to enable that operational excellence. Agreed, Mark. And then, so we, we've gone through who are the players, what are the challenges, how, how are the considerations different based on what your use case is? And, and I think the next logical step is, okay, what are, what are my choices? And the ones at a high level we think about are adapting your existing system, maybe you're using SAP or something like that, an ERP or, or PLM uh, that you want to adapt for additive. You could build something custom. We all have really smart and capable IT and development organizations that could build something, or you could adopt uh, an additive specific operating system such as Link 3D. And the way we evaluate these is essentially bang for the buck. Where can I get the most strategic value for the least uh, investment and complexity? And looking at each of these, you can adapt an existing system. You don't capture all of the strategic value. You could with your own custom solution or an operating system. And then the level of effort and complexity, um, adapting an existing ERP or PLM, really high effort and you're not gonna get the full bang for the buck. So I, we like to think about, that one's not really a long-term solution, but building custom and adopting out of R. Um, and it, it makes sense to uh, explore the details of these. And Kenny, you've built a model here um, to evaluate them. What, what is, let's start with custom solution. Um, what is this model? So essentially, Mark, this is a, a game effort matrix. Um, and first we're gonna focus on building a custom solution here. So. On the bottom, in the x-axis, you have your complex to simple in implementation and maintenance. And on the left, in the y-axis, you have your strategic value from low to high. So obviously, where we want to be is in that top right corner. So simple implementation and maintenance with a high strategic value. And if we just pinpoint one of these, let's take machine connectivity, for example. Implementation can be very complex. You know, you could have different technologies, and each different technology has different methods to monitor those technologies. And in addition, processes are constantly improving and managing and maintaining these processes requires ongoing effort and upkeep. So you have to start to think, you know, would you rather maintain this connection in-house by building a custom solution or find a partner who's evolving with industry improvements? Yeah, and, and when we talk about machine connectivity, it's everything from the stuff you could see by walking by, is it on or off, but all the way to pushing and pulling information from the machine so you can really streamline your operation. That's where you want to get to. Agreed, Mark. Which leads us to adopting an additive ecosystem here. And the first thing you're going to notice is everything switches up to the top right. So more simple implementation and maintenance, keeping your high strategic value. And I've added something here, build prep integration, which really wouldn't even be possible if you wanted to build your own custom solution. So there's additional benefits as well. But if we take machine connectivity again, now let's move to this simple implementation and maintenance, keeping your high strategic value. Because now you have a dedicated team where this is their core business. And someone like Link3D 
we're now acting as that translation layer or gateway layer that's going to make it all done in one system rather than multiple systems. And essentially making that data that you're getting from your machines language that you can actually utilize for your business. Yeah. And I think we, so we've hit on machine connectivity. Um, but another really good example that I think a lot of people overlook is analytics. Um, having a unified data layer, as our CTO Vishal likes to say, really enables that operational excellence. If you can collect all the data in one system, that's how you can start to make decisions on the data that both make your CFO happy because you're getting higher return on invested capital. I'd love to see a happy CFO, but also create those automated decisions in the future. And that, along with a built-in quality management system or QMS, um, working together, that is what will get you towards process maturity. And that, which leads us into the future. So we've we talked a lot about where are we today and what do you need today? But another model that LinkedIn has created is a maturity model. Um, Kenny, how do you define this model? So Mark, this is essentially where we've seen a lot of customers that we've spoken with. You're either in the reactive, informed, managed stage, and we're trying to get customers to more of an automated and predictive stage. Um, a lot of companies that we talk to find themselves in this managed where, you know, we have a lot of point solutions. We have Excel spreadsheets for scheduling. We have emailing for orders. We have our own way of creating data analytics, but it's not all streamlined in one platform. So what we keep seeing is people hit this wall where they're trying to get to this more automated and predictive stage, but they don't really have a system in place that can help facilitate that. So our goal here at Link3D is really to help you get to that automated and predictive stage one, by introducing the core applications. And then along with that, implementing levels of simulation, automation, and algorithms that are gonna help you start to predict situations rather than react to problems. Yeah, and we've seen some very elegant um, processes using SharePoint, Jira, things like that, that work really well today. Um, but they're not capturing all the benefits of additive, and they're definitely not gonna help in the future. That's where they hit the wall. And, and I think it's it's good to now think about, well, how do you do this? And, and why is an operating system different? And the way we think about it is, is really comes down to the architecture. And on this slide, the blue boxes, the box at the top and the, and the oval, are what Link 3D or an operating system like that does. The top blue box, those are the applications to bring data in and out order entry, analytics out, things like that. The oval, that is your end-to-end -end process, all the way from scheduling to managing your um, production, production workflow and the data lake to get all of that information. And then Kenny, the, the thing we're thinking about for the future, or designing for the future, are the white boxes. Exactly, and these are the third-party applications. You know, We talked about machine connectivity already, build prep integrations, so really being able to not only connect to the hardware, so the actual post-processing machines and additive machines, but also connecting to other integrations through, or integrating into other software systems. So you might have a CAD software system you wanna integrate with, or some DFAM tools as well. So being able to have a system in place that has integrated into these systems and will give you the benefits by integrating into these systems. Yeah, and, and that's where we see the industry going. We see the industry going towards very specific pieces of best-in-class software that have API connections into your operating system, and then connected hardware, whether it be machines, post-processing um, machines as well, but all that data, which comes in different languages, being translated into one common language and stored in one common database. Yeah. Um, and then, not to make it more complex, and. and Keep in mind, Kenny can send you these slides. They may look a little small, um, but then it's integrating within your existing system. And your corporate infrastructure, right? A lot of companies will have their own ERP systems, like you mentioned, Mark, or your own PLM systems. So making sure we can start to push and pull data from your corporate authority layer is vital. Yeah, and, and on this slide, in the gray at the top, those are the existing systems um, that your company has. 
that that you're going to keep. We're, we're not saying you need to change this. You just need to create the links to the blue boxes at the bottom. That's your additive operating system. And that's where the data, um, they talk to each other. And you may notice in this two things towards the future as well. On the left hand side, you can enable a customer portal, whether B2B or B2C. So you could have a digital inventory and customers can actually enable a transaction from your additive services. And then on the right, you can have external facilities that you manage as part of your digital twin, all within one workflow. And ultimately what that allows you to do is have real-time disaster recovery where you have visibility into it and all the data is collected as well, eliminating that risk. It's, we haven't tried to make it complex, um, but it does look complex and we're here to help. And, and if you guys have any questions, there's a Q&A on the right side of the, uh, of the screen here. Feel free to drop in any questions you guys may have for the, the panelists afterwards. Um, and if you wanna go to this link that we have pulled up here to get a digital assessment, feel free to go to this link or reach out to me directly and I'm more than happy to have a conversation. Because ultimately that's what we're here to do is help on this additive journey. And um, we've expressed our point of view, but I really wanna hear what Faisal and Dan have to say because Faisal has sat in the seat at Baker Hughes and Dan is an expert at X1 in how all of these ecosystems work together. Exactly, let's bring them up. All right, so let's introduce uh, Faisal Iqbal from Baker Hughes and Dan Brunemer from X1. Looks like we've got Dan on stage. Dan, how's it going? Great, how are you doing, Kenny? You can doing hear me well. okay? Hear you perfectly, hear you perfectly. Great. Let's wait for, uh, I think Faisal's joining us right now. So while Faisal is joining, Dan, Maybe you wanna give a brief introduction of yourself and, and X1. Yeah, sure. Sure, so uh, I'm Dan Brennerman. I'm technical fellow here at the X1 company. I started in uh, 2001. I developed our first uh, commercializable printer called the R2. Um, I was here whenever we did our uh, sand transformation and bought uh, Generis and turned them into uh, another X1 brand. Um, here in oil and gas, I'm about some of these topics, especially what you guys at Link3D do. I mean, I think that a lot of our customers, especially in the cascading markets, really find a lot of value in things like a digital warehouse and digital storage. I mean, square footage is money. So, you know, for some of these you were talking about in the midstream applications like pumps and valves, these can be massive, massive uh, casting form to keep in some box and, you know, Technology there, uh, you know, tying that uh, digital warehouse together with digital production can really make for a powerful thing. So I'm looking forward to talking about all those uh, aspects. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. And it looks like we've got Faisal joining. Faisal, can you hear us? Yes. Perfect. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. So maybe you want to give a brief introduction as well. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of these topics you guys discuss is just kind of we deal with every day. And um, happy to join the conversation here. And um, <clears throat> digital transformation is not something that, you know, it's 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 not a event. It's it's a journey, and um, you learn your way through it. And all you hope to know is that you know what's the next step is in this, because it's a lot of it's uncharted territory as well. So um, we we learning, uh, and uh, we're learning with, uh, you know companies like you and through our customers and we are adapting to it and we're seeing things uh, our company itself is changing in a broader way that uh, what some of you guys uh, know of us uh, as a oil field services company you look at bakery hughes it's oil services company but as we look at next 30 40 years um, there is going to be increasing renewables there's going to be increasing natural gas in there but the all will remain a major part of it. We still think so. And, uh, but the digital coming into play, the industry 4.0 coming into play there, the whole industry is gonna go complete transformation. And uh, it's not something there is a, you know, the answer book is written somewhere. We're gonna learn through it as, as we go through it. So um, in that line, we are our company, we know more any 
oil fill services. We are really engineering technology company and we're making bets around various technologies. We think they're going to play a pivotal role transforming our company industry as well. And you make a good point. That's why we're trying to host situations and events like this to bring the industry together so we can all share our knowledge and grow together. Um, so we've got a few questions here in the QMA, Q and A. So let's just start with one that we have here and I'll direct this towards uh, Dan first. Uh, so Dan, how does digital transformation affect AM qualification programs and standards that are being developed? For example, API 20S. Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, a stand, standards serve a principal purpose of unlocking a supply chain, right? You were talking about how uh, in, in this industry, like every other, there's the OEM, there's the tier one, there's the tier two. If I'm a tier one or tier two supplier and I want to supply uh, parts into this industry, I don't just want to buy an X1 machine that doesn't have any kind of, uh, not guarantee, but generally consensus-based acceptance for this application. So these specs like API 20, um, GNV, uh, or yeah, GNVUL, I was just like on a panel with them yesterday. Uh, of course, we do work with SAE, ASTM, ISO, DIN. I mean, we're joining all of these standards organizations around the world. And frankly, I kind of view the lack of standards as one of the most existential threats to the industry. Mm -hmm. And the, the lack of standards geared towards additive manufacturing. Yeah, the lack of standards that, you know, because everybody knows what rot properties are, everybody knows what yeah. cast properties are, and uh, what an ad I didn't even get to talk about our direct metal additive manufacturing yet for parts, our direct parts business. But you, until those standards are in place, I think that it's going to be exactly what we're seeing now one machine at a time, one part case at a time, one application usage at a time, until we can demonstrate and industry agrees with us through the acceptance of these standards. Because these are all voted on too, right? Like a standard doesn't just come from the OEM, it comes from an OEM working with a customer, working with a supplier, working with users, you know, and it's all about building that consensus over time that yes, this technology works. And as we are successful in developing and promoting these standards, Standards. We'll be more successful as a business. We'll unlock Baker Hughes's ability to reach out to their tier one and tier twos because they'll be able to say, buy this machine because we already think these parts are fine. That's kind of the whole point. Agreed. And if they saw, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I would attest to this one part at a time. We're still at that stage. It's, it's, it's the. It, and I look at it here as well about uh, question the spare parts program for Baker Hughes. Um, I would say it's a learning that we have to really learn the process, the modalities, and then the tools that work for it. Since I know this is a tools related discussion in there, but we are solving use case by use case. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is how we're approaching it um, because there is no one one solution for our all sitting there at this moment yeah uh, i think the journey will be you go one by one and then start fi final uh, you know find a common ground common sets of solutions in there mm -hmm. until then until there are uh, these standards available um we can touch some of these critical parts that that mm -hmm. i mean i think sometimes people don't realize that just having a machine at your in your shop doesn't really do you much i, I mean I guess you can sell some of the toys and others, which do doesn't really, if they go break, you don't have a um, environmental disasters yeah, for you. Critical. But yeah, yeah, for, yeah. You're right. for, for us, is, um, we, we're highly specialized um, uh, industry. We also have set of standards that we must follow. There's, there is nothing we can do about it. Yeah. So until these standards, uh, and we have active engagement there, until these standards are fully established, uh, we will continue to basically look into, you know, the, the peripheral uh, items, not as much as the core critical um, mm -hmm. areas. Which leads us into a, it's a good segue to this next question um, regarding mach machines and technologies. Sure. What, what additive technologies do you see the most relevant for oil and gas? And we can start with uh, Faisal on this one. In terms of you talk, uh, if you are talking with from metal, you know, just the modality side of it, the powder bed fusions are going to play a big role. For, 
right? But as we're going into other areas, the DEDs is it, it's coming as well. It's it's playing uh, its role in there. Now that's the side of the process side of things in there. In terms of the software technologies, being this is more of a software, we see is topology optimization, generative design. See why we it comes back to the why why add it. What is it bringing under the table? So for us, it's a couple of things. It gives us the ability to have innovative and efficient product design because it kind of unleashes those constraints that a traditional manufacturing puts you onto it. The other piece is once you have qualified the process and the parts in there, you can build these parts day in, day out at a very fast pace, a lead time reduction in there. So um, when you look at all this, you, we need tool sets in terms of software side, generative design, topology optimizations. Those are the core engineering pieces there. Then we also need execution systems where once you get into this stage of where you are building parts day in, day out, and you have a multiple parts out there, you may not be building same build tray every day or every other. You will have different parts. So that means an execution system like yours or others will be able to go out and simulate, simulate fast enough and give the production manager a, the whether this production bow is a viable one and get the quality out of it. So there's a lot of these two technology bees uh, come into play when you talk about the software. Agreed. And Dan, do you have your two cents on technology since you're yeah, my, my two cents about additive technology is simple i think there's room for all of it everywhere i mean e even you know concept models plastic models i'm sure that those are very relevant for an offshore company maybe trying to just imagine what a new drilling rig might be like sure none of that's useful but it's very helpful to a design engineer or whatever so but from x1 i mean as i say castings is a big part of it um being able to iterate rapidly through say turbo machinery prototypes, pump prototypes, valve prototypes, things like that. Um, that's a really big part of it. Castings are huge. Uh, if you go to our website, one of our most like serendipitous uh, interactions ever was with a little company called Altera that uh, makes downhole drilling pumps. And one of our material systems just happened to be a perfect match for that application. And now with our direct metal parts, you know, now that we're doing true 316 through 17 for tool steels and uh, we're moving on from that to other things you know i think there's going to be a spot for uh for binder jet in in across that whole across all three sectors of up mid and downstream we just have a lot to prove that we do that we do and we have another great question here i want to facilitate here so we've got two votes on this one are there any relevant applications for additive manufacturing within the renewable energy industry as we move away from oil and gas? And Dan, you can uh, you can take the first pass on this one. Sure. Uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what we say here at X1 is that we turn powder into parts. So it's really a question, again, of finding the right use cases. I mean, maybe it could be as simple as something as a special kind of uh, bracket for holding a steerable um, solar panel in place that you couldn't manufacture using some other method before. Or maybe there's going to be some ultra light weighting applications like Faisal was talking about how we can do all these new generative designs, topology optimizations. Um, I think that as we do more of that and as we more for these particular markets, um, they're just going to keep opening and opening. Hey, Saul, would you like to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I can name the company because it's one of these sessions like this. I was in with another in, uh, person uh, from energy utility company, and they're actively producing non-critical parts on their for plastics or for non-metallics for their for wind turbines. For so there's a lot, a lot of that going on. So yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised where people are finding the solution. You know, solutions for for in, in across the industry yeah so all the way to stuff like wind turbines and things for yeah. that industry got it mm -hmm. um here's another great question for you guys how do you see and this goes along with digital catalogs which we mentioned earlier how do you see the emergence of digital marketplaces affecting oil and gas 
I and, know, uh, five star go first. Yeah. Yeah, five star you can take. Yeah, uh, so we, we're looking at pretty aggressively. Uh, we, we think that there is a place for this. Um, of course, given all the standards and everything needs to play, it may not be one of those things, hey, here's my part. Can anybody print it? That, that we don't think so because any part that um, that is out there in the field, there there is behind that years of knowledge and testing, and and then and there is a lot of that information sitting in there. So I don't know if there would be a case where somebody takes a scan of it and put it there, and then even though it was somebody else part or EM, and some other company would just print it and then be able to use it within days in there. There's a lot goes on behind. You have the metallurgy. You have you you you, you need to make sure that uh, somebody sign up for the liability of it. So, but having said that, connecting customers to you know connecting all these uh, stakeholders there, it's a big place for market. And that's one of the area our business wise we're looking into very very aggressively. Our one of the. Uh, business, you know, for, for within us is how do we set this marketplace together? And you make a good point, like machine to machine, you can have the same machine, but they're not going to run <laughs> the same, right? Each machine has its own personality, if you will. And then someone like Baker Hughes has the recipe and all the parameters for this part. So it's not as easy as just taking a CAD file, putting it on the same machine and printing the part. That's not how it works. Yeah, there, I think, or to earlier point, there's a few things, a couple of items that you have to have industry knowledge. It's not like tomorrow we can start printing a, you know, air, aerospace part or, or somebody from Boeing start building up a, you know, tool downhole uh, from it. There, there, there is not only standards, there are experiences, there are testing facilities. So that's that industry expert. You need that company. Then you, of course, need a knowledge of additive processes and modalities and machine parameters. And then the third piece is really the digital tools in there that kind of tie all pieces together there. And until you have all of these together as, as a recipe for, for as a company, um, it, it's tough to just basically, a, a, you know, service bureau type if, if, you, if you relate to that marketplace. Mm -hmm. That would be my, yeah. And Dan, do you want to chime in on this one as well? Well, I just want to say, I mean, from our experience, it's one of the things it's going to do is, uh, like Faisal just said, it's going to shorten lead. Um, and uh, a lot of our customers are finding with their casting business, like kind of uh, in, in certain applications and certain very high value applications. You were talking earlier about drill bits. Um, our technology kind of gets used there and they've found like a marked reduction in cost for creation, especially if you want to try and do a couple of different prototypes of a different build drip, drill bit size or shape or whatever. Um, that's kind of, I, I think that that's going to be one of the ways that it gets used a lot. I mean, it is now and it seems to be continuing that way. So guys, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, we, we still have a few in the Q and a here. Um, here's a good one. So how, do, how does machine connectivity play a role in enabling quality management? And whoever well, feels strongly yeah, about it can, yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead. Dan. I'll just give one example. One thing that we talk about a lot in standards committees when we're working on these are things like an unplanned work stoppage, right? Like machine runs out of powder, somebody forgets to fill up the binder bottle things like that. What happens when the machine actually winds up having to stop for some period of time? Connectivity, you know, a big, an important part of connectivity is you can alert the operator, creating a log file that the event happened. You're starting your forensics right at the source. You've you know, you start investigating, like, why did this work stoppage happen? And if you don't have some kind of connectivity there in, in, a, in, in a relatively simple case like that, um, you're, you're waiting for the operator to walk by the machine and notice it stopped. So even just like the simplest, subtlest little things about machine connectivity are extremely important. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, for quality management system. So all of the quality management system that exist, they exist, came out of 1990s learnings and the, the whole, you know, mm -hmm. Subtractive manufacturing. This is where you have six sigma tool setups and all, all the other one as well. How, how, and there's years of you know 
uh, qualification that went in Brown. So those are pretty set rules in there. The principle will remain the same, but machine connectivity is important because that's where the data lies. And this is where the digital transformation comes in because to be able to go grab, connect to that machines, get the data in the time that you need to it, and then be able to uh, analyze it and then report it out and then prove that these pieces of processes did meet the spe specs that we needed to do it. So in that, machine connective plays a big role because this is where it's happening most of it. You know. We just had a question come in, Faisal, directed towards you. Um, okay. How does one make a case to invest in digital systems? For instance, how do we demonstrate ROI to our leadership to invest in digital transformation? Look, so the, if you take it, 1990s was really digitization. Whatever you had into, into your paper, you turned that into, you know, uh, electronically. Then this 2000s and of lately is digitalizations where you're streamlining your processes. Everybody has ERP sitting there. Everybody has PLM for five, 10 or 15 years. And then looking back to it, so that's the digitalization. The digital transformation is really about, are you able to transform your current processes or current business to be able to generate new revenues? That's really transforming your company model in there. And there may be smaller in size as first or the bigger in size. So I think if you look at the digital transformation and look at from the from creating new streams of revenues is where you would probably find a better way to put your investment in there. And that's what I would say at this point. And then you'll have a much easier uh, path towards it. Mm -hmm. uh, Otherwise, it's still streamlining your processes, which you can do it through productivity uh, and then through other uh, means that you can also, in, especially in the case right now, is the lead, lead time reduction. That's, you know, for supply chain, it's a big thing. So, so I would say for digital transformation, look for uh, new revenue generations through whatever you plan to do with the digital tools. Yeah. And Dan, do you have a perspective on this as well? Yeah, I just want to say, yeah, I'll just tag on to that. Ultimately, if you're not taking advantage of the thing that additive brings, like topology optimization, weighting, um, simulations, all that kind of stuff, if you're not taking advantage of all of it, it's really hard to prove an ROI on a direct part-to-part -part replacement. I mean, um, Sean, uh, or I mean, the Barnes Group advisor, or Barnes Global, just gave a presentation yesterday about how they call that the Valley of Death, trying to say that part A I'm making today with regular old man is going to be part A that I make with additive, and it's going to be cheaper. That's the most difficult argument to make. Um, you really, if you're trying to present this to your leadership, you need to also emphasize what gets enabled. You know, what are the what are the substantial benefits? in addition to cost. And, and and honestly, if you can't find another benefit, it's very difficult to justify. So utilizing- Yeah, if, if, yeah I was just gonna mention, so utilizing all aspects yeah, that Adam can bring while also finding new avenues to generate revenue. Yeah, if you're, with additive, if you're not improving your product and you're just replacing A to A, I think you're gonna lose out the business mm -hmm. case to it. Um, you I think uh, when you, you would want to look the part that you're replacing with to a, these tools that I've mentioned there and then see if you can make it more efficient. And there are opportunities you definitely should be able to make more efficient and more, you know, uh, more or more um, high performance in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where your ROI start coming in. We have another question directed to you, Faisal, and Dan, you can weigh in as well, uh, sure. from Brian Murphy. Uh, who wants to know, do you believe additive manufacturing will make American manufacturing more competitive with overseas manufacturing? That's a good question, right? So the world is smaller. Um, I think in the in, in initial stage, yes, definitely, because a lot of great IP-related work is done here in the U.S. Um, but understand that there the are overseas, world, you know, as well, that they're working towards it as, as well, towards uh, uh, towards this uh, uh, additive side of it. 
if purely cosplay, it would you will continue to struggle with if you just basically try to make a cost case for for additive within US, you will really struggle with it. I think it needs to have a broader um, outcome or, or value to it. And as long as we we continue to brought those in there, uh, then um, it's just not going to be the cost. It's it's more so than it's improved products, yeah. uh, highly innovative products. That that is where we definitely will have upper edge than you know most of the overseas. Uh, I agree. And, and if I could have you know one other way to look at competitiveness beyond cost competitiveness is risk competitiveness. Now, what are all the rest of your supply chain and what value? put on those risks and what kind of risk mitigation strategies are you willing to undertake to make sure supply chains are unbroken and i think that's another way to look at the competitive here in the u.s couldn't agree with you guys more um we've got a few more questions before we can break down back into uh the networking sessions here we got a lot of votes on this question uh how do the material properties of as printed metal am parts compared to those via traditional manufacturing processes. Can parts be used for their intended applications right off the printer? If they saw, you can take the lead on this one. Yeah, I mean, you have to go through the qualification yeah. process. It, it's, I mean, it's a completely different kind of physic, physical behavior going on during printing if you take power, power bed or that. So uh, all parts have to go through. Uh, it is not right off the pr printer. And they still there is post processing. It's still there, you know. You you need to process the part to further. So it's it's not just. A, I mean, unless the, these are non critical parts and non plastic. I mean, like I said, toys or that even those requires a little bit of a you know post processing. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, material properties, uh, it, it's something that we are learning, and it's case by case. I'm Dan. I'm pretty sure this is a this hits close to home for you as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, what I'd like to talk about is how we're able to match the MPIF standards that they have set in place, you know, the Metal Powders and Internet Federation. Uh, they do have standards in place for metal powder processes. Um, but again, uh, you know, what you find in, in standards often is layers. So there might be a standard at SAE and then another layer at ASDM and then another layer by API. And so, you know, whether or not these are actually usable out of your printer as is, I mean, a, a lot of that doesn't, in fact, as Faisal say, come down to testing. All of these processes are near net shape. So if you do have like a precision flange interface or something like that, that's always going to have to be, you know, post processed, machined, polished, whatever. So, you know. So we've got one more, we've got two more questions. We've already touched on one regarding ROI and getting investment. Um, but for the panelists, for you guys, are there any other considerations when thinking of digital transformation in oil and gas that we didn't mention, Link3D didn't mention today? And if they saw, you can take the lead on this one as well. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we touched in the next past hour, a lot of aspects of it. Uh, I, I would just say that um, the, we, there's a lot going on in the industry beyond just digital, you know, transformation. That, that's the enabler. Um, there's a lot of marketing forces there, and the the, the workforce. There. So we just need to. There, there is a sustainability side of it. Decarbonization efforts going on right now in in, in industry to be able to uh, provide a safer and, and, and efficient uh, energy. So, yeah, that's 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 an area in itself that uh, requires a lot of consideration from the oil and gas side as well. Yeah, I agree. Dan, how about your perspective? Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I think we touched on a whole lot of things. I guess I'm not sure how much we talked about simulation, but I wonder how much simulation uh, plays a role here too. And actually, I would ask that of Faisal because yeah. I'm not quite sure what all gets Yeah, we, we, you know, I mean, for us, it's, it, it's a big play. I mean, to, to, we're doing a you know, there's a lot of simulation work. So all these tools that the topology optimization and others that they are simulation mm -hmm. driven back end. So um, a lot of that is, so it's, 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 it's a core of our designing and engineering for it. Um, I mean, you can have a separate session altogether on that. 
Yeah. We've actually got one more question here we can dive into. Um, so what are some lessons learned from both of your experiences to scale AM education and training awareness at large enterprises? How to make AM a manufacturing strategy for every engineer? So spreading AM awareness within your company, essentially. Well, that's a tough one and for me to answer because we've always been aware of 3D printing at X1. <laughs> <laughs> so you are. <laughs> Yeah, uh, like I said, it, yeah, it, it's been a journey. I, I think um, we just need to do more and more communication. Uh, Sometimes these things become more siloed activities. So as long as there's a lot of communication, that's 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 that helps out. And it's it's it, additive is not a competing um, to you would say that's attractive. Is I think it's it's the, the the world ahead is hybrid. Not every case probably be additive suited for additive. So, and then there's a lot of learning needs to happen in this. So if you communicate in that light, people start to say, hey, here's another way to look at it for my part. Here's another way to be more efficient in my design. Um, and then that's one thing is something that we would just all need to do now. And, you know, if I could just add one other thing there, I mean, one, the way that we really are, um, focusing on education training is by making education training programs, making those available to our customers where they can replicate them inside our own or inside their organizations. We team up a lot with universities, colleges, uh, um, community colleges, you know, like this, you know, when it comes to workforce development, that happens you know, in universities and community colleges. So we're focusing a lot of our efforts and again, standardizing our learning units, explaining the technology, both from a practical user standpoint to an R&D standpoint, to a developer standpoint. And those are all three different types of education you need. So that's kind of how we're handling it is through like, you see all of these other certification programs coming on. We're starting to work with some people to develop those things for binder jetting as well. Exciting. And, and uh, Faisal, do you have anything you want to mention on marketing groups to support educational programs? Yeah, I mean, we partner with everybody. I think we, we this is one thing that uh, we work with, the, with them and then um, uh, kind of create materials out of it. Uh, and then go out internally next time. So yeah, that's kind of given yeah. uh, pretty much nowadays, yeah. Well, those are all the questions we had for the panel. Um, thank you, thank you both for joining us today, Faisal and Dan, it's been, uh, it's been great. No, thank, thank you, you thank you for time. having me. It was, of course. It was really nice meeting you, Faisal. It was a really interesting conversation. Yeah, it was nice meeting you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dan and Faisal. Uh, we will now be going back into the networking room um, so you can turn on your camera and microphones and double click onto any empty seat and we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks everyone.